Hello, my name is Rosario Granados. I am the Marilyn Toma Associate Curator Art of the Spanish Americas at the Blanton Museum of Art. And I really would like to thank uh, the organizers of the Lozano Long Conference for the invitation to be part of this fantastic celebration of the Benson uh, Latin American collection. And also I want to thank you for tuning in um, either today, Friday, the 25th of February or whenever you are being able to watch it. So um, I want to start by sharing my screen. Um, and we're going to start with this. Nothing Memory, Space and History in 16th Century Mexico was an exhibition open to the public at the Blanton Museum of Art in the summer of 2019. It featured 19 of the 37 mapas of the Relaciones Geográficas that, that since 1937 are part of the Benson Latin American collection at UT Austin. Studied in detail in 1996 by historian Barbara Monde and others before and after her, these maps were previously displayed in various art museums, but this exhibition marked the first time that so many of them were displayed together in one single, single venue. Perhaps it was also the first time that they were conceived as the main pieces of a show, opposed to being one more among a larger collection of items like it was the case in Visual Voyages, Images of Latin American Nature from Columbus to Darwin, an exhibition organized by the Huntington Library in 2017. This presentation reflects on the goals and reception of the Blanton exhibition, wondering how this corpus of documents so dear to the Benson Library were experienced once they transcended their archival environment. Before I continue, I want to thank yet again to graduate students in history and art history, Brittany T. Erwin, Darren S. Longman, Catherine H. Popovici, as well as Associate Professor in History, Susan Dean Smith, and Florencia Bassano, Assistant Curator of Latin American Art at the Blanton Museum of Art, for all their assistance in editing the labels in the exhibition, some of which I will be sharing with you in the following minutes. Mapping Memory was organized in three sections, each corresponding to the three main concepts in the title. The first one, History, presented the rationale of the whole show in the introductory label, which read as follows, which is exactly how you, you, could, you, you, were, you, would, be ha you would have been able to see it the way it is now in the, on, on the screen. In August of 1519, an expedition led by the Spanish explorer Hernando Cortes left the coast of what today is Veracruz and began marching inland. Just two years later, the Mexica capital of Tenochtitlan, now Mexico City, fell to an ethnically diverse army composed of both Spanish and indigenous peoples from other cities. This event, plus the deadly epidemics that soon developed after the siege, launched a process of colonization that historically has been labeled as a conquest and even as a genocide. However, the historical record shows that from those who survived, many were able to negotiate with a degree of success their social status within the new ruling system. This exhibition aims to expand our perspective on these events which have marked Mexican identity to this date. By featuring a series of maps created in the late 1500s by indigenous artists, these documents show some of the visual strategies native map makers used for the endurance and perseverance of their cultures throughout the so-called colonial period and well beyond. The exhibition goal was indeed to bring awareness to the Spanish invasion of the Americas consciously avoiding framing it as a celebration or as a lament. But why doing it through maps that were 60 plus years, that were made 60 plus years after the arrival of the Spanish troops? Mainly for two reasons. First, 
The University of Texas at Austin is uniquely equipped to provide a more nuanced revision of this particular moment of Latin American history, thanks to a rich collection spread all throughout campus. Indeed, the holdings of the Benson Library, which we have been celebrating for the past new few months, but more specifically during these two days of the Lausanne Long Conference, are well complemented by those from the Harry Ransom Center and the Dole Briscoe Center for American History. Those two were also lenders to the show. Secondly, the maps are outstandingly beautiful and deserve attention beyond the specialized audience that they usually attract. As Mundy and others have argued, the map has constituted an undeniable record that the invasion did not meet complete annihilation. Hence, the maps became the obvious way to bring to the forefront research by Federico Navarrete, Matthew Restel, Guy Rosat and others regarding the ways in which cultural, political, artistic and racial negotiation developed in the aftermath of the Mexican-Spanish War. The Mexica-Spanish War, sorry. In order to provide the historical context that made sense of the show, its first section incorporated three books, a German translation of the so-called Cortez Second Letter, which narrates the actual siege of Mexico Tenochtitlan, including a compendium edited by Italian historian Peter Martyr in 1550. The 1596 English edition of Lopez de Gomara, Historia General de las Indias, and Bernal's Historia Verdadera de la Conquista de la Nueva España. The idea behind these three objects was to show how the military campaign was soon followed by a strong editorial enterprise that allowed the Spanish invasion to be known in Europe only a couple of years after the events. The label accompanying the books allowed the visitors to recognize how each of these chronicles were defined by the specific goals of the writers. The writers, a rebel perceived by some contemporaries almost as a traitor who needed to build a narrative of exceptional deeds for his own legal and moral recognition. The official account of the war that justified the conquest as a spiritual undertaking and thus sought to place the Spanish monarchy above its European peers. The war veterans account that aimed for material rewards but that failed to mention that the army he was part of was far from homogeneous. It included not only Arabs and Africans who were brought to the new world as slaves and servants, but also other indigenous peoples who saw in the Spaniards an opportunity to overthrow the powerful Mexica. That first gallery on history also included a short, section, a short section focused on cartographic history. The label read, when the news of the existence of a so-called new land spread throughout Europe, defining its cartographic image became an obsession for the Western imagination. As early as 1500, map makers began to represent the coastal silhouette of the continent now known as the Americas. Outside the, USA, the United States is simply called America. Contrasting previous conception of space that were based on religious ideas, 16th century European cartography relied on empirical evidence and scientific methods based in mathematics and geometry. This section included a copy, which you are seeing here on the left, of the first printed map of the world, or at least of the world as, as Europeans conceive it before the travels of Columbus and Vespucci. In the image, the earth is depicted according to a biblical notion that identified the three different continents that were known at the time of its publication with the names of Noah's sons, Sem, Asia, Yafet, Europe, and Cham, Africa. This small map was accompanied in the show by two other European maps that were very diff different in nature. The one you see on the left, on the right, sorry, one was, um, was the description of America of the New World by Abraham Ortelius, published in Antwerp in 1587. The other one on the bottom of the image was a watercolor on parchment showing Italy's province of Rovigo near Venice from around 1600. 
By presenting these three dramatically different maps, the goal was to establish a context of what was expected of a map in Europe when the RG maps were made, and to imagine how they could have been received upon their arrival in the Spanish court. The Ortelius is one of the earliest geometric maps made of the Americas, a most accurate depiction of the world as informed by scientific means. It shows the north in the upper section, thus privileging an orientation marked by the magnetic pole. The Italian map, in contrast, has the north placed at the bottom, privileging a complex network of canals that connect dif different settlements. This map shows a human environment, whereas Ortelius aimed to create a visual representation of the entire world, thus providing a path towards its European colonization. The second section of the show was space. It was there that most of the RG maps were displayed and their specific context was provided, explained as responses to a questionnaire sent out by Bill Philip II of Spain in 1577, which was also in view. The king and his advisors inquired about the specificities of the so-called new world. They had particular interest in learning about natural resources for all these extraction purposes and better address the needs of the population. Some of these maps were made by Spanish officials, while others were made by indigenous artists. Many maps represent a broad region rather than focusing on a specific settlement. This method allowed the map maker to portray the colonized territory more comprehensively while also drawing attention to commercial routes and social networks. Authorities or members of the clergy of the Spanish descent crafted some of the maps like the Tequequilco map, where a river full of fish is shown as an essential um, resource. Maps like that of the Atlahualca Suchiaca depicts a large region unified through the characteristic footprints that refer to the transit of human travelers, placed in a spell in a space filled with Spanish inscriptions. The map of Huehuetlan, on the contrary, includes Nahual text, thus indicating the input of an indigenous literal novel in its crafting identify as Juan Hernandez in the written response. The criteria to place the maps together was to encourage visual conversations among them, like in the case of a grouping called Bodies of Water, where in addition to roads, rivers, and lakes, in addition to roads, rivers and lakes were depicted using native modes of representation, characterized by thick color lines that indicate the flow of water. Interestingly, in the case of Cuscatlan, hoofprints were also used to signal the path's commercial usage, with the north being included to the left as it common on most of the, of the corpus. A paper mill appears in the Culhuacan map, so the exhibition also emphasized the different materials used to make these artifacts. Deer skin in the Tengo and Miskehuala map. Spanish paper, like in the Iztapalapa and most others, and even Italian paper, like in the case of Veracruz, where a modern mark revealed, revealed to us its provenance. The third section of the show was mapping memory. In there, we place maps that collided spatial, social, and temporal representations. We feature maps with an evident checkered grid and a large plaza at the center. Such wide open space structured the social life of each town through specific buildings for government, law enforcement, commerce, and religion. The label explained that the urban grid, the plaza, and the central church are also accompanied in some maps by the symbol of the Altepetl, a mountain-like figure visible on the left side of the map of Tetlistaka. This Nahual ideogram, composed of adult water and Tepetl mountain, in English is most often translated as city-state, to highlight the political cohesiveness and a strong sense of community of each town. Among the largest pieces in the show was a map of Amoltepec, which includes three different languages, Mistec in addition to Spanish and Nahuatl. This allows us to illustrate how the term indigenous, normally used to describe the makers of these maps, fails to distinguish the many different cultures living in the Americas at the time of the Spanish invasion. 
and does not consider the centralized government imposed by the Mexica. The cultural landscape was not homogeneous in any way, and the gorgeous map of the Zacualco made a strong case about it. The label included a diagram from Mundi's book to explain the 10 generations of local rulers that appear on the left of the map. Time blending, however, happened within the paper surface and also in the gallery walls even further thanks to a series of four watercolors made for the exhibition by Mexican artist Mariana Castillo de Val. By deconstructing rivers, lands, and roads through multicolored dots, following the circular shape of the original map, the artist illuminated the aesthetic features of the indigenous image. With this series, with this series the artist continued her exploration regarding how ancient artifacts can be recast by modern observers, investigating the role of archaeology and indigenous culture in our understanding of identity and history. But enough with the summary of the show. As you can see in the slides, mapping memory displayed the maps flat in individual pedestals in the case of the most uh, of the larger ones, or assembled in groups of three or four for those folio sized. Although visitors were unable to touch them and thus lost the paper smell and texture that are key components in the experience when consulting them in the library setting, it was possible to observe them in close detail and walk around them, something that has not been possible in other museum environments. The cases were specifically designed to encourage slow looking experiences and were placed in the gallery to enhance the visual connections between them. There was also a map to locate in the current geography of Mexico, each one of the towns mapped in the artifacts on display, based of course in the work of Albert Palacios, who created the digital, digital platform of the RG, RG maps that I'm sure many of you in the audience know and have used in the past. In each gallery, we added QR codes with suggestions for further reading on the perspectives of the conquest of Mexico and on Euro 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 European and indigenous cartography, as well in the history of the events and collection. The complete list was shared in an, in an exhibition's minimal website once our audiences explicitly asked for it. Because indeed, I can assure you, the maps made people curious and depending on their background and different expectations, they did want to know more. We indeed discovered that maps in general have very active fans, just as much as those interested in all things Latin America. The exhibition did not let the maps lose their historical or ethnographic relevance, but brought their aesthetic components to the foreground, and through that made them available to a much broader, wider audience. A recent book about the collections of Mexico's National Museum of Anthropology discusses whether or not there is an intrinsic value embedded in artifacts, claiming how relevant it is to understand the criteria by which they are historically displayed and collected. Mapping memory wanted a, di a diversity of perspectives to collide in the maps and engage in historical, ethnographic, aesthetic, architectur architectural, and material conversations. It was never the purpose of the show to provide a voice for the indigenous peoples who made the maps, but to question the li linear Eurocentric vision of the most standard narrative of the conquest. Like the maps, the exhibition assumed that the North could be in a different location and that representations of historical facts, just as much as geographic sites, could be challenged. Most of the journals that featured the exhibition are, or were, not surprisingly, focused on art and the visual arts, but we got reviews from Texas Architect as well, not surprisingly, as the maps are all about the built environment. To our surprise, the show caught the attention on NPR's National Desk correspondent Wade Woodwin, who was fascinated by the beauty of the maps and their context. Many conversations among us went on before his reporting came out on air. He was particularly shocked by the assertion that indigenous peoples in the army that, that achieved the fall of Tenochtitlan. 
This is, of course, common knowledge among historians since decades ago, but for him, it was new and shocking to acknowledge it on national radio. In the Facebook comments to his article, people said things like, yes, this gives me much uh, um, 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 a new and deeper appreciation of maps and their stories, but yet they all contained religion forced upon them by European Christians. Native Americans didn't have written languages. Who applied the place names and why? Those questions are the result of the visibility allowed by the museum setting, which to me is certainly to celebrate. It is a pity that those readers could not visit the show as the article appeared almost when we were getting ready to the install, but I wonder how conversations regarding the role of religion could have been enriched with, its, with the visual understanding provided by the maps where the church buildings become the new center of the Altepetl, or how much would NPR audiences would have learned about pictorial indigenous languages and their persistence decades after the Spanish invasion. One conversation that it, I did have the opportunity to have with many visitors was that related to the ownership of this cultural patrimony. I was asked, how do you feel as Mexican to have these indigenous maps in Texas rather than in Mexico? I answer that as a Mexican, I don't identify as an indigenous, but as a woman of mixed race. Mestiza has its own problems as a category, so, but I won't go um, deep into that right now. Because of that, I do not struggle you know, the fact that I consider myself a, a mixed race. I do not struggle with the fact that the land depicted in the maps was invaded. I prefer to acknowledge that there are many similar maps in the Mexican archives and that these specific ones were made explicitly to leave the, the territory currently known as Mexico. Eric Van Jong, in his essay for the Benson Centennial book, is vocal about this issue as well, stating that although it might look like modern imperialism, the property of these uh, maps is not really. He argues, and I agree with him, that these documents came to UT Austin as the result of a monetary transaction. They were purchased, not stolen, or yes, but from a Spanish archive, most likely. Plus, they're not a store at the Benson to control an official perspective. Rather, the library's commitment, just as much as the museum's, is to promote an area of perspectives. I am convinced that by allowing them to be seen and appreciated by wider and diverse audiences, cultural artifacts like the RG maps play a remarkable role as sort of cultural ambassadors, continuing to assert, even if from, from abroad, their native history and identity. Moreover, the fact that these maps are held in a public institution that educates students from across the social and racial spectrum and is located in a state that has its own shared history with Latin America and with Mexico in particular, certainly adds another important layer of public service. The impressive digitation project initiated in recent years by the Benson further tells of the institutional response to this delicate issue of cultural heritage and property. Through this initiative, the library has been successfully sharing its holdings with some of the communities of origin. By displaying artifacts like the maps, the Blanton equally makes evident its commitment to expand and complement the narratives imposed by European art, considered until fairly recently to be the universal canon of beauty and artistic practice. In the long standing debate, whether the art museum is a place to educate or a place of leisure, I think it is safe to say that an academic art museum like the Blanton has the capacity and responsibility to be both, multiplying the voices that express different, though equally valuable, visual codes and aesthetic standards. Perhaps this is the reason why mapping memory and at the end, the RG maps were picked as one of Hyperallergic's best 2019 exhibitions. Let me bring this presentation to an end by saying that mapping memory is not the only time that the Blanton has displayed Benson materials in its galleries. 
The partnership between these two institutions has been key in other projects related to the art of the Spanish Americas, but also to modern and contemporary Latin American art, like in the avant-garde networks of Amauta, Argentina, Mexico, and Peru in the 1920s, and Words Matter, Latin American art and language at the Blanton. And I'm sure it will continue to develop even further into the future. Thank you. <laughs>